it's a happy day for me. I'm having here Emmanuel Daniel, founder of the Asian Banker, Asia's biggest strategic intelligence business platform for financial services. You, um, you have founded several companies. You are a global speaker. You have traveled. You just mentioned this over a hundred countries. You've seen a lot. Um, you have written a fantastic book, the digitization um, of finance called um, The Great Transition, the personality of finance, personalization of finance is here. So Emmanuel, thank you for being here. Thank you for making it to Out of Consensus. I mean, thank you very much for having me on your on, on your program. And uh, uh, you've done uh, great work as well. I mean, you're an entrepreneur, so you understand uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, yes, in the last 28 years, I built uh, the Asian Banker, and I used that as an excuse to travel uh, to many of the all of the countries in Asia, except maybe it's North Korea, um, and uh, and understand their banking, financial services industries. And then over time, I built another platform called Wealth and Society, uh, which gave me an insight into ultra high net worths and and how their influence in society. So today, I, I just keep traveling. So greetings to you from uh, Riga in Latvia today. Um, and Hi. the questions that I I um, that I occupy myself with today, um, you know, having written my first book, which is uh, The Great Transition, The Personalization of Finance is here, is that as I was writing that book, I, I realized that if finance becomes personalized, then entire soci societies are going to become increasingly personalized. Um, you know, and so I'm occupying myself with uh, thinking through, um, you know, which will be our next winning civilizations, winning, uh, you know, nation states, winning people, winning communities. Um, and traveling helps you to get an essence, a feel of the essence of, of different societies. And sometimes you see parallels between societies that, that don't even have anything to do with each other. So, so I'm having fun that way. And when we discussed about what we should talk about in this chat, um, we came to the topic of China. And I recently been to Shenzhen and you see like loads of brands of electric cars that you did look splendid. Um, society seems to be very competitive, technologically advanced. And a lot of commentators pretty much say, okay, so, you know, that probably means that China's tech superiority is inevitable. And you said you disagree with that statement. Do you want to make yeah, your point? So, yeah, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not dis disagreeing, um, um, you know, at initial, uh, I'm asking everybody to go back to first principles to understand what makes a country successful uh, right. and then build um, uh, an assessment of the chance of a country becoming successful, or in the case of China, which everyone wants to be able to say is that it's the next, um, you know, uh, defining country, uh, or, or you know, for the rest of us. Okay, so um, there, there are many assumptions in in that kind of thinking uh, that, that that don't hold to first principles. Okay, um, now if, the, if this was 1950, that's five years after World War II, and we were having this conversation. And we asked uh, which are the most um, you know, promising countries in Asia, we would have said Sri Lanka, okay, Ceylon at that time, uh, Myanmar, Burma, uh, and, and the Philippines. And the Philippines GDP was the same as Japan in 1950. Okay? Uh, and they were, they were uh, importing maids from, from China uh, you know, in that period of time. And then what happened? Look at how the whole, um, you know, the whole, the, the whole idea uh, got stood on its head. Uh, and this exact, these exactly the same three countries became basket cases almost, right? Uh, and, then, and then have to, um, you know, retrace their path and so on. So the thing is this, um, China is a successful country and China is a country uh, that has to be respected for what it's achieved. The, the first thing that we need to um, ask ourselves uh, when we assess China is not to be um, enamored by the incredible success. I mean, it's awesome. I, I spent, you know, um, I, I, well, during COVID, I was there for two years uh, and, and, uh, and oh, wow. I've, I've had a business in China since 2020 that I'm there every month, okay, and I'll be back there uh, next week. So, and, and, and I'm, you know, very familiar with the um, key people and so on. So now the thing is this, um, um, 
we, we need to first predicate what made China successful for what it is. And all of those reasons that people give that it's an ancient civilization, uh, that, uh, you know, that it, it is actually smarter than the West and all that, um, that's not necessarily true, okay? The China of today, if this was 1911 leading to 1918 when, when 17, when they threw, overthrew the Qing dynasty, the, the Chinese intellectuals were saying that we're not good enough, uh, you know? And what did they do? They threw out their dynastic system and they then went on a 50-year journey uh, looking for a political structure uh, that, they could, that could hold them together until they reached uh, 1949, which was uh, the start of the, of the communist uh, uh, rule of China. You know, and, and you don't lab, label communism as being good or bad. That's the way it's turned out. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a form of government that is able to hold the country together, right? And then that government went through a lot of processes which were difficult um, and dark periods before they reached uh, where they are today, right? So, um, um, and I've seen, by the way, the same phenomenon in Rwanda, okay? Um, Rwanda today looks like the Singapore of uh, Africa. Mm. Um, and then I, when I asked, people in these countries, uh, what made the difference? Their reply is, because we saw the alternative. Mm. Okay, because we saw the alternative. If you met some of the economists who uh, make the mirac mir miraculous um, transition for China to uh, come into the market economy, uh, they they met uh, in uh, in a in a in a location called the Morgan Morgan Shan, which is Morgan Mountain. Uh, you know, um, after after the uh, uh, Cultural Revolution, uh, and and started um, constructing, and many of them were young in their thirties at that time. And and I know a couple of them. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know several of them, but but a couple of them very close uh, today, um, um, who who were part of that process of trying to figure out what to do to make sure that China learns from the best economic theories exactly. of the world uh, and yet uh, and yet responds to it in, in a way that is sustainable for China because J Russia didn't do that. Russia and, and, you know, embraced, uh, 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 embraced uh, the, the Big Bang approach uh, wholeheartedly um, you know, to, to its own detriment, right? So, so those are the parts that need to be put in place to construct the story to where it is today. Now, today, what the, the big question is, uh, which countries are going to ace artificial, artificial intelligence and the knowledge economy, right? And the knowledge economy is, um, is, uh, is, is rending all of us asunder, meaning it's tearing apart entire countries uh, and leading with the United States, right? Because the technology originates from the U.S. and the U.S. has a liberal, um, clean sheet approach to how to deal with knowledge. Whereas every other country in the world has a curated approach. In other words, we still think that we are able to take bits and pieces of the knowledge economy and apply it to our countries, and then close us close ourselves off to um, to to um, you know to to, to the things that we don't like, right? And then that's a, a function of the political system and how competent the state is. Now, when I assess a country, any country, I take five or six elements. Uh, or I call them institutions, and I stand them against uh, alongside each other, and I see the interaction between each of them. The state, okay, the significant individuals, the ultra high network, the the multi trillion billionaires like you know Jeff Bezos and uh, and 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 Steve Jobs and and so on, okay, and and uh, and then I I look at uh, the unions and how uh, uh, how work is uh, organized. Uh, and then I look at the individual and I look at other institutions that are significant. So in some countries, they are the Catholic Church, for example, and so on. And how they, how they um, um, you know, interplay with each other. Now, very simply is this. Uh, the, the countries where the state is competent, okay? And China, the state wasn't competent 10 years ago. The state is becoming increasingly competent. Um, stands against the country where... Uh, the entrepreneur uh, has the biggest sense of opportunities that he can build on. Okay, and Singapore, for example, um, uh, has a competent state, and therefore you don't have um, large businesses uh, that that are built from the ground up. I mean, Singapore imports uh, Chinese billionaires.
Uh, that, those don't count, okay? Uh, and if you look at the stock market of Singapore today, the, the l- largest uh, uh, companies on the stock, ex- stock exchange are now the banks. Uh, mm-hmm. And banks are bad uh, because they are not real economy, uh, you know, and they are absorbing the entire profit pool of the country. Uh, and that's all that Singapore has left for itself. Uh, and Singapore... Um, gives the impression that it is uh, very supportive of entrepreneurs, but the moment you become of a certain size, the state will absorb you, okay? So um, so like this, I, you go country by country to see that interrelationship. A state has to be competent to a certain measure, uh, but not competent enough that it doesn't lean on entrepreneurs to build some of the large businesses. Uh, and then the, the, the relationship uh, between large businesses, which is an institution uh, category of its own, uh, and the rest of the population. Now, if you take the United States, for example, in 1995, um, the, you know, the large corporations in the U.S., starting with GE, um, had this standoff with uh, with the labor force, uh, and they 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 made it very clear to the labor force that if you don't keep wages down and we don't have the right to cull the you know the lowest unproductive segments of the working force, we're going to take uh, the jobs out to China and India, uh, you know, and we 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 we're going to keep your 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 cost of labor um, um, uh, as low as possible, right? Now, the thing is this, um, and, and, and today the U.S. is paying for it. Um, you know, our wages haven't risen uh, as high as inflation um, and, and the whole, um, you know, the communal structure of the labor force uh, is in disarray, right? So, um, so you take all of these factors and put them alongside each other. Now, the biggest thing about the knowledge economy is this, that um, you need to embrace uh, the the the. The, the effect of knowledge um, wholeheartedly. Now, anyone who tells me that China is the future AI, my argument against them is this, China banned Wikipedia. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, if you, if you, and I know Jimmy Wales, okay, and he, he can't say anything nice about China. He doesn't say anything, but, but right. he doesn't say anything nice about China, right? And, and, and they still try to uh, interact with him to say, can you bring a, a form of Wikipedia into China that we can still use? So when, when you think about what's happening with ChatGPT, what do you think um, Robin Lee is doing? Robin Lee is looking at this whole monster of chat GPT and, and he can't respond fast enough because he needs to figure out how he can edit himself uh, for the state, you know? And, and so he has to second guess the state as he is uh, embracing the technology. Um, take that into AI, right? In, into the fullness of AI. So, um, so don't tell me that it's a given that China is the future of AI, okay? Until it's able to um, em- embrace um, all of the effects of AI, uh, and yes, there will be, you know, uh, dysfunction in, the, in society uh, and, and problems in structures and so on, um, and un- unless it allows itself to go through that process, uh, it's not going to be a leader, okay? The leadership will come from somewhere else. And the, the other thing about AI is that you need the ability to garner uh, intelligence uh, and and knowledge and um, and and creativity uh, from around the world. Okay, if you if you go into my blog, I gave a speech in Nanjing. Okay, to the Nanjing government that um, the thing about the chip industry uh, is that um, you know in the morning uh, uh, in uh, you know someone in Silicon Valley, uh, a systems engineer or architect, uh, starts his work. He passes it on to his colleagues in Japan, and then to Shanghai, and then to Singapore, and then to uh, Belgium, and then to um, London, and back to uh, to the U.S. Okay, so the, the whole creative process of the chip industry swirls around the world every day. Um, so a country like China has to figure out this idea of uh, the, the the supply chain of knowledge. Um, mm. You know, uh, you, and the, the thing is this, uh, and I'm not saying all this to say one is better than the other. A zero-sum game approach to uh, to uh, ex- excellence and to breakthroughs in technology and knowledge uh, is the wrong way to think about it. Okay, so anyone who says starts by saying, well, uh, all the knowledge is going to be created in China or or you know India or, or the U.S. Uh, is is not thinking about it correctly. Uh, you know, uh, I mean. Take take a average aircraft, the triple seven, sixteen countries. Uh, you know, the, 
um, and and uh, Airbus A350, about the same, 15 to 20 different countries uh, involved in, in different aspects of engineering to make um, you know a, a complex uh, um, technology possible. So today we're thinking we're talking about the complexity of the technology uh, as well as capital uh, that is put in uh, to to make um, you know ideas a reality. Uh, China has benefited uh, from the global capital that is um, that is uh, that it has access to, but now that and 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 people don't realize that global cap capital is finite. Uh, today, you can't get valuations like you used to in China because global capital has started moving elsewhere. And suddenly in Southeast Asia, a company called Grab uh, is able to do a $40 billion spec, which is bigger than any of the stock markets in, in Southeast Asia um, because global capital um, you know, has uh, thrown its cards down to, to support uh, something from Southeast Asia. And eventually, Africa will benefit too. Um, you know, and in India, uh, which used to have only like 10 um, fin fintech uh, um, unicorns, uh, today I hear that they have about 100. Okay, so suddenly India looks uh, interesting. Um, so capital um, and knowledge, these two elements are redefining uh, which will be uh, the winning countries or the winning um, nation states or winning communities, right, uh, of the future. But then, but then, like you think a little bit, and you know everything is relative, right? So um, if it's not like a China that's cutting edge or number one, um, then it must be someone else. And um, a big factor that you kind of you know, you know quickly talked about as well is the is pragmatism in in you know in in governance in in the interference of the state, so to say. So when I look into the Western world, um, there's not that much pragmatism left in in like you know coming from Germany. I think there's like a they they lost all pragmatism in in all sorts of areas. So um, China seems to be still very pragmatic and is actually like willing to go out, you know, collect technology yes it is um, you know also like domestic and there are certain kind of certain knowledge that you cannot have but i'm i'm just wondering you know like since you have this kind of steady and pragmatic approach in in many ways like how does it make an impact because it seems to be you know that in in many areas there's the, the, it, the direction hasn't changed yes there's southeast asia there's there's india that is kind of pulling capital a lot and this recovery like this year has been like very disappointing to to most but like um don't you see that there's still some sort of steadiness as well you know uh china's biggest growth uh was between 2010 and 2014 okay right. uh and this was the time when both capital uh, and technology innovation matured. Uh, the iPhone was invented in 2007. Uh, by the time WeChat and Alipay were uh, fully formed and, and WeChat Pay started was 2010. And you know, this, this short window of 2010 to 2014, there was no government. Okay, the, the government was like um, very supportive of the, of the structures uh, of, of the innovations that were taking place. And they were like looking at it and, and just wow. This is huge, um, you know, and and government was only starting to uh, form its uh, response to these huge technologies, um, um, you know, just about that period. And that was also the period that China, for the first time, had large corporations that were not state-owned enterprises. Okay, the, the listing of uh, Alibaba, Tencent, um, you know, Baidu, and so on. Uh, that's a totally new phenomenon in China. Okay. Um, and then 2014, the state started getting its act together and, mm -hmm. and, and starting to put together even the, just the idea of governance, because uh, a lot of governance in China was uh, at the provincial level. Today in finance, for example, they have a super committee that sits at the state council uh, that coordinates uh, all of the, um, uh, you know, all of the financial uh, institutions and innovations and so on. Okay, and but they're also taking too structured an approach that it is it is it risks becoming brittle. Meaning that um, you know having one committee at, at the national level running it, um, you know, can't deal with everything all at once. You know, so the thing is that this thing about pragmatism uh, actually only applies uh, when a state uh, is in its early formative entrepreneurial stage. Uh, when the state gets organized. 
um, it, it loses the pragmatism, okay? Uh, for many things in the U.S., they've lost the pragmatism, okay? Um, like payments, for example, the U.S. is the worst country, uh, you know, the, 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 the least developed payments infrastructure uh, because it's super well regulated. Um, you know, you talk about pragmatic, they're very pragmatic. They're so pragmatic that they don't want innovation. Um, you know, and uh, and they don't see a need for innovation. Also, because that's why I say knowledge and capital put them alongside each other, and then assess um, how the how the field evolves. So China looks uh, pragmatic because you see so much of the innovations uh, around you, and you think, wow, this is a great country. Um, you when you put it in a time series, you realize which period it happened. Uh, what is the period that we are going through right now? Uh, and, and then the outcome of that uh, into the future. Um, you know, so like India, for example, had an incredibly competent, not say comp is an incredibly corrupt government, but it had its tentacles in every part of society that it stifled, um, you know, creativity, it stifled uh, capital, it stifled um, innovation and, and uh, entrepreneurship. Um, you know, so entrepreneurship is uh, coming through in India because it's breaking through the state uh, and trying to, you know, uh, make breakthroughs in technology that the state has no control over. The, the reason IT uh, became an uh, important pillar of Indian economy was because the state didn't know how to control IT 30, 30 years ago, right? But they, they controlled everything else, the oil and gas industry, the airline industry, the um, you know, and, and everything else. Sorry? The supermarkets, yeah, yeah. The supermarket, the food, the food supply chain. And they, they earn on the side of the small farmer, uh, you know, and therefore you, you, you don't have industrial, 80% of perishable food perishes in India. Uh, you know, so the, the productivity is so bad that food prices can come down if, if they only kept a lot more of the, uh, of the perishable food, um, you know, uh, accessible to the customer. Um, you know, so... Um, now, but then when you apply capital, uh, the, the country starts to look different and the ability, the promise of the country looks different. And you see this also in, in the aerospace industry, right? Why is China looking so good on the aerospace side? Because they deploy capital and that's a state deployment of capital. It's not uh, from uh, foreign investors. It's the state saying that this is an area that we want to be good at. So the areas where the state has uh, deployed capital, uh, they grow incredibly, um, you know, and um, so, and India, you know, does do a few, um, um, you know, launches of uh, satellites cheaply, but when you put more capital into it, Elon Musk is able to do it better than India, right? And, and cheaper than India as well. So, so the ability to deploy capital to uh, technology uh, is, is the other element that we need to look at. And capital is flowing. It's, it's looking around the world for the best returns. Uh, and right now, um, uh, it's not a zero-sum zero -sum game for China anymore. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's been distributed around to India, to Southeast Asia, and I see a little bit uh, taking place in Africa. Um, you know, and uh, and then you need to follow the money to see uh, where the next breakthrough will come from. And talking that, you know, when when we discussed, okay, <clears throat> China's kind of tech superiority that everyone is kind of talking about might be more fragile than people think. Where do you see opportunities, or how do you take advantage of it? What are the areas or industries, you know, that might, you know find their haven somewhere else and that like you know might be very interesting to um you know to to see where the, where it's going you know if you take the super app um um development and industry um every country or many countries around the world have their own versions of super apps mm -hmm. okay it's not uber or you know or, or amazon um uber mm -hmm. and amazon look big uh, because they of the capital uh, that they've been able to garner to to put in the engineering talent to to scale them as quickly as possible, and then of course they they, they existed in the largest uh, market of the world. But if you go to Russia, they have a super app too, and mm -hmm. they're very proud of it, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, and then China has its super app, and they're proud of it, and and it's a lot more commercially viable because of the capital uh, that was put in to to make that possible. So when you think about um, you know which countries are going to be able to demonstrate leadership. I think three, you know, these two things, capital, knowledge, 
uh, and then scale, right, uh, has to come in. Uh, and that's where we start saying that, oh, you know, the largest countries of the world, um, you know, have a, have a promising future. Uh, but that um, has to be stood against another problem, which is with a lot of AI, uh, it actually diminishes the role of human labor, right? Mm. And, and, and the ability to, um, the ability to, uh, to, to create leisure is much more uh, a creator of opportunity, creativity, uh, innovation, and so on than, than jobs, right? So, so then you start looking at the countries that previously you would have thought of as being lazy, uh, and 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 yet uh, they might have uh, you know the, the the community, the 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 assets, the infrastructure to enjoy life, right? So, uh, so the thing is that uh, we we need to put these elements alongside each other to start to see uh, where these developments will come from. Now, the 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 argument that China and India are the future for two or three reasons, right? The first reason is that they are ancient civilizations. Um, uh, that's not true, okay? Um, what China is today, the Communist Party is a creation of of the um, of, of uh, Karl Marx in in France, right? And uh, and in Germany, and um, and um, um, and they are experimenting structures which are essentially West Western. Uh, you know, and uh, India did have an uh, incredible collection of knowledge, uh, but they didn't renew that for uh, for the world that we live in today. You know, and they, they need to figure out how to um, how to be a, a builder of knowledge, which is different from being a service provider, right? So uh, that's one, uh, and the other is because they are large countries. Um, it may it may well be it's the countries that are. Uh, have got uh, very strong grassroots um, infrastructure that will ace the last countries. You know what? Bangladesh used to be a basket case. Today, yeah. the per, per capita GDP of Bangladesh is higher than India. You know, and how did that happen? Because for the last thirty years, uh, the the microfinance industry built grassroots organizations that made women uh, responsible for their own economic um, you know, income and uh, economic activities and so on. And, and it all added up uh, to a very stable and sustainable um, country, uh, you know, far more than India is. So, so we need to look at how the fiber of the grassroots uh, are evolving to, to see how it, uh, how it will hold together. And the other country that has, is, is an unsung hero at the moment is Indonesia. You know, oh, and it's sure. like nearly 300 million people, again, used to be almost a basket case uh, and today has a thriving uh, domestic economy that is the envy of the rest of Southeast Asia. So still, obviously, Emmanuel, you are going to Beijing, I think, or, or, or China, um, in, to, to several places. You're going to talk to many people. You're going to you know, present the ideas in your book, but also you're going to have like some um, other interesting chats. So what would you tell them? You know, having like our discussion in mind, um, how to embrace knowledge and how to embrace capital to, to, to make it better. You know, when I have these discussions, uh, the first thing I find I have to do is to break down um, a lot of these um, headline type biases uh, that are running around in the world. It's yeah. not, a, when I say to the Chinese that it's not a given that China is the future of the world, I'm not saying that to put them down. I'm saying that to, give, to start a real conversation on what the issues are today that we need to deal with. And I love China. I love being there. I grew up with Chinese people. I have Chinese people in my family, you know. So, so I have a stake in the business that that mm -hmm. uh, in the in the business of seeing a country like China uh, succeed, um, you know. But but when we have when we bring that bring it down to the first principles, uh, then we realize what the issues are, and then and then we construct it from there. Um, you know, Ray Dalio, for example, is totally unhelpful. Uh, in the way that he gives China a blank check um, without right. discussing the issues. I'm sorry, but but uh, that is actually irresponsible. It, it's very interesting. Like, um, I mean, his book and uh, the world order and like paints this very, very clear packed, uh, picture about these certain factors. And it's kind of like, it just like, you know, brings us to this inevitability 
that's how it is you know d deal with it um but uh, okay no, if, if you if you look at how Ray Dalio discusses it he he gives China a lot of credit and then he discusses the US uh, for being dysfunctional for being indebted and so on not realizing that China actually suffers the same thing as the US but he won't discuss China on the same elements as the US the, China is now the debt to GDP in China is 300 percent, uh, you know, and, and I personally can see the how uh, local governments, OK, provincial governments can't pay their bills. OK, um, the, uh, the hotels that I stay in, the general manager tells me that that um, that they were promised to be re re uh, recouped for expenses that they made for certain events. And, and, and the, the, the local government just doesn't have money. You know, mm. so um, um, so you you need to put both uh, both countries on the same plateau plateau of discussion, and then and then start dealing with the issues. Um, you know, and then and then you come up with a conclusion that makes sense. Just remember this: 1950, we all thought Sri Lanka, Philippines, Burma, that didn't happen, right? Right. Um, so today, 2023, we think China, India, you know, uh, um, you know, whatever. I mean. There are many countries with aspirations, like Saudi Arabia. Once uh, is totally capable of being a significant country uh, in the next twenty years. Uh, but I will test them uh, on the elements of uh, knowledge, uh, the knowledge economy, uh, capital, um, you know, and 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 then the the five or six institutions standing alongside each other and how they they interact with each other. Emmanuel, before we wrap this up, um, how can people follow your work? Apart from mm. Sandra, thank you very much for this. Uh, I, I I'm I put some of these ideas into my blog EmmanuelDaniel.com, and my blog is a good starting point. You you'll see the businesses that I run. You'll also see the book that I've written, and my next book that is coming out, uh, The Winning Civilization, will be out by next year. Emmanuel, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Cheers.